Hi, friends. Thank you for being with us again. This is Sunil Chandy, and this is Food for Thought. Uh, thank you for connecting with this ministry out of Christ's Episcopal Church. And yes, I'm in the, in the church sanctuary again. As you can see, it's not, a, it's not one of those green screens. It's the actual um, stained glass windows uh, behind me. And so uh, thank you for being with us. And if you are with us, please do connect with us. Tell us you're watching. And of course, there's Natalie Gordon who's watching. Natalie, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, being with us and connecting with us. And today is a, is a very special day, as is all days. It's great. We've got a wonderful guest uh, and, one that is, uh, and one that has been with us uh, many times before and offer, giving, going to who it, she will offer us wisdom and, and insight uh, to, the, to the very present challenges that we have in our lives. Um, and so if you are here, uh, continue to connect. I know that there are people who are uh, watching us in different platforms as well. Uh, today, uh, you know, this uh, usually what we do at the very beginning of the show is just have an insight from scripture. And uh, I'm looking over, I was looking over the scripture this for, for this coming Sunday, and, and Psalm 130 is a really powerful one, and one that is, uh, it, it might offer us some really uh, uh, good insight as we face challenging moments. Uh, it starts off, out of the depths have I called you, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand, but there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him, in his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Uh, it's a powerful psalm. It's, uh, it's one of 15 psalms that are considered to be songs of ascent. Uh, they are they're psalms, that are, uh, psalms that are actually... Um, you know, as pilgrims make their way up to the temple, uh, they are these these psalms uh, from 123 to 135. I think uh, are the ones that people um, people say as they move up uh, towards the temple. And I love the the beginning of that uh, psalm. Out of the depths have I called you, O Lord. Uh, you know, out of the depths means out of the, the most desperate situation, out of the most darkest and direst uh, environments, I call out to you. And and I think about I think about that because there are times in our lives when we feel so abandoned, so lost, so out of uh, touch with the the environment and out of our our sense of control. And it's at that time that we're most you know, when we feel most vulnerable, that we cry out. I mean, it's it's kind of like that foxhole, foxhole prayer that uh, that atheists sometimes uh, that we say that atheists uh, say. It's it's when you know I don't when everything is going well. I don't know necessarily know if there's a God or there's. But then all of a sudden, when things go crazy, people cry out uh, because they feel the sense of lack of control. And this psalm is is a psalm that's is an antiphonal song, a psalm. It's a leader who speaks, speaks, and then there's the congregation that responds. You know, and the and the response is usually, verse six: "O Israel, wait for the Lord, for there is for the with the Lord there is mercy; with Him there is plenteous redemption." You know, the psalmist cries out and expresses the desperation, and then expresses also the trust that there is a a forgiving God, a, a a God of grace, a God that takes us uh, as we are, because uh, even in the second verse, it says there is forgiveness with you. Um, if you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, O oh Lord, who could stand? I mean, yes, we're not perfect. And and the psalmist is, is saying, OK, God accepts us in spite of our lack of perfection and uh and accepts us and knows us who for who we are but there's also this wonderful thing about this in the uh, i was thinking about this psalm in, in that you know if this is god god knows everything right why would the psalmist need to cry out well there's a sense that it is 
uh, personal. This relationship is personal. It is one crying out and then hoping that God listens. And then God, God turns one's direction and, and listens and, and responds. I think it's a, it's a really powerful psalm. I think it's, uh, it speaks to some of the things that we might be feeling at times in our life. I know certainly at the very beginning of the pandemic, I felt like this. I mean, it felt like I was crying out of the depths uh, because all that I had known uh, was uh, all of a sudden, everything that was in my control was no longer in my control. You know, um, the pandemic did that to me. I mean, uh, death does that to me, especially of, of a loved one. You know, you could, we also feel sense of, sense of uh, lack of control when we lose a job or when uh, the situation does not work the way we hope it to work. And, and then we cry out. And then, and then there's this moment of waiting, right? And faith, and it's, a, it's, it's an active kind of waiting where we're just waiting and we're breathing and finding even a sense of calm uh, in the trust that we might have that somehow uh, we'll make it through. Through the pandemic, and I, I don't know if this is your experience, but I, but I know that when I was waiting, um, I, God answered in different ways. My eyes were able to, were disoriented, and so I started to see new things, new ways in which uh, people were being creative and, and connecting with one another. And so sometimes in that dark place, we might be able to see new connections, new hope, new joy, and new ways that God is working. I know that's certainly been my experience as I, I've waited for God many times in many different dark places in my life. Uh, God has always come through. Uh, today we have, a, a, again, a wonderful um, guest, and this is uh, uh, Deborah Royce is a guest who is who has been with us so many times, and she's walked with us through uh, the dark times of the pandemic and connected with us. And uh, today we're going to be uh, talking with her about her new book, uh, Ruby Falls. I'd like to read you a little bit before uh, bringing her on board. Um, I, this is one uh, writing piece of writing about it. Like the chilling psychological thriller, thriller The Silent Patient, Deborah Goodrich Royce's Ruby Falls is a nail biting tale of a fragile young actress, the new husband she barely knows, and the, her growing suspicion that the secrets he harbors may eclipse her own. When a little girl is abandoned by her father in a cave, can she grow up to be healthy and whole? Eleanor Russell is an actress at the top of her game when scars from a childhood wound begin to unravel the threads of her life. Fired from her show, she bolts to Europe and marries Orlando Montague, a man she has only just met. Back in Los Angeles, desperate to create the perfect life, new husband, new house, and a starring role in a Hitchcock movie remake, Eleanor believes it is all coming together, but her stability is threatened when Orlando reveals a sinister side, secrets from the past are unearthed and the specter of the cave becomes unavoidable. Sounds like a great book. Uh, Dave, please bring Deborah on board. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Hello. Good to see you as always. It's always a joy to see you and talk with you. Uh, I, I, I love that uh, the poster behind you. So yeah, this is my tour poster. I will have it tomorrow night at the Ocean House when I'm talking with the author Luann Rice about Ruby Falls. And that's a fundraiser for literacy volunteers of Washington County. So that'll be fun. I got this idea from another writer, Jeannie Blasberg, who is a Watch Hill writer. And it's, it's like a, a screen. Like remember your grandfather, he would do home movies and he'd pull up that screen. Yeah. So you just take what you know part of your book cover and you have it done like that and what was fun you know when I was really on book tour for my first tour is it kind of created an instant stage set so right now at home I'm leaving it permanently set up although I'll bring it up to watch hell tomorrow <laughs> I love it I mean it just it creates an environment right right uh, yeah 
you know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I have, I don't have a screen to pull down. <laughs> you have something a little bit better, I'd say. <laughs> but it, it, it adds to the environment, to, to, the, to the conversation. It informs uh, people. Uh, you know, it, it helps people to understand that this is part of uh, what was important in your life and is important in your life. And so that's beautiful. I love it. And so, and do you take it, do you take it to, do you have it on your book tours all over the country? Yeah. Well, uh, so I, uh, there's not been a lot of all over the country yet. I will travel to Nantucket at the end of July. Yeah, I'll bring it. And I'll travel to the Midwest in late September, early October. I have events in Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, and Indianapolis. So wow. I'll fly to one spot, rent a car, pop this in the car, and then drive around. Everything's about four hours away from everything else. Everything's farther in the Midwest than New England. Wow. So, uh, but I like to drive. <laughs> but uh, isn't that going to be kind of tiring? Is that, but you might be energized by it because you're. You know, I am really now starting to do a little bit of listening to audible books. I, um, so I think I will really develop that habit in, in the car. Yeah. I love audible books. I mean, yeah. and that's probably, um, I mean, that's how I read your last book. I, I had it on audible and I was biking and it was just amazing for me. Well, I think you will enjoy Ruby falls on audible. The actress's name is Stephanie Willis. Uh, she has just a beautiful voice and she does all the different characters so well. She made me, and I know the story, she made me fall in love with Orlando Montague and I know what he's up to. So <laughs> she did such a good job with him. Well, you know what? I mean, uh, part of the reasons why, and I read a, a little bit of the excerpts of, uh, of the book. I haven't re uh, read the book yet and I'm going to, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and, and, you know, it just... When I connect with a book, I always connect because uh, not only the characters are just uh, and interesting and and uh, and they're creative and they help me to think, but they also at help me to think about the deeper questions. You know, I, I love when even in this in this uh, at the very beginning, uh, you know, when you ask when a little girl is abandoned by her father in the cave, can she grow up to be healthy and whole? I mean, I think that's an important question. When does trauma, when trauma happens to a person, can they somehow find transformation and life and joy afterwards? I mean, and that's, uh, that's so an important question. It is the question, really. And I think for me, and I'm sure for you and anybody who's listening to this, well, I can't speak about anybody else. I'll speak about myself. I am a big believer in psychology, but for me in my life, it has only taken me up to the point where then I could do deeper spiritual work. The psychological work has been extremely helpful for me dealing with whatever I've had to deal with, but the spiritual component for me was kind of the final glue. When I wake up in the middle of the night anxious about something, I rely more on my spiritual work than my psychological work to kind of get off the ledge and go back to sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I have my, uh, I have a spiritual director and who's also a therapist. I mean, it just, I've had him for, uh, 20 years. And one of the things that, um, that that's really interesting in our conversation over 20 years, and I started to reconnect with them during the pandemic, is that some of the questions that I used to have when I was in my uh, late 20s, early 30s, are still the questions I do have even now, uh, 20, 30 years later. And, um, or, uh, but the uh, the questions are it's almost like cyclical they they never go away it isn't that it, that you resolve an issue the issue always comes back but there's there are different voices that now you could pay attention to that that um, that help uh, diminish the effect of the negative voices 
So, right. Right. So, if you, if, if you, I'm not fatalistic, but I do think we've each of us come here to do something. And when I say to do something, I don't mean a particular job. I mean, we've come here to kind of, we're working our way back to God. So in working our way back to God, things come up along the way. And why do certain things come up for me, for example? I can't speak about anyone else. And I think there's a repetition to certain things that I have to face in my life. So the way I tend to look at it is, hmm, maybe there's something I didn't quite get here about where this is really leading me. Again, I don't see our challenges as punishment. I don't see them as something, you know, I, I'm not saying any of that. Only looking at myself. If I have a certain issue in dealing with people, and if I'm dealing with that over and over and over again, I feel it's incumbent on me at a particular point to say, there's something here I'm supposed to learn. And there's something here that maybe I need to change about the way I operate, the way I look at things, about how seriously I take myself or whatever this situation is. Does that make any sense? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think this, and it, it comes out in the book, I would think, because here's this, here's this issue of this child, six years old, who is abandoned by her father uh, in a cave in a dark cave and then um and then you would think okay you know at the end of it uh, you know her mother comes to the rescue she's okay and life is moves on and then she goes into and and she becomes successful but then the the issues come back again uh the abandonment issues and it just and it just uh it hasn't really resolved even though it's been masked over it seems like well that is a, a crucial point in the book. So Ruby Falls is, it is both a Gothic thriller and by Gothic, I mean, it has kind of spooky overtones. And with most classic Gothi no Gothic novels, like you think about Jane Eyre or Rebecca or The Woman in White, those are some of the biggies from the Victorian era. You, you have a, a generally a young woman who seems to be in some peril. She is under the sway of an older, uh, more powerful man who may or may not have her best interests in mind. And as she is facing these challenges, you go on this journey with her and, you know, figuring out what's happening. So with, with Ruby, who grows up to be Eleanor, she does seem to have coped with what happened in her childhood. Her father leaves her in a horrific way. They're at a tourist attraction. This cave is, you know, there are people go visit it. There's an underground waterfall and there's a certain point where they turn off the lights and that's when he disappears. And she can't make sense of it. So part of her quest to figure it out is, and I think this is something we do, she becomes obsessed with some conspiracy theories of the time. And a lot of them have to do with the Kennedy assassination because that was a biggie in the 1960s. And, you know, nobody knew was it the CIA or the KGB or the FBI or the Cubans or, so she goes down all those rabbit holes, including this thing called the Dixie Mafia, which I didn't even know about, but I read a couple books about. And it's what, what you would imagine. It's an organized crime group from the South. No. It's very, very tawdry. <laughs> As she's searching for this, what is she really looking for? If someone does something so terrible to us, I think it is basic human longing to seek out a good reason, a big reason. Surely if my father left me in such a way, it had to have been something. The KGB got him. The FBI got him. He was spirited off or something. Um, I think we want it to be something big. We, we want a justification. That's the word. What would justify a father doing something so uh, horribly negligent to a child? Yeah. No. I, I, I love that. And you know what? To tell you the truth, I was thinking as I was reading... I start. I read it. I started reading one of the excerpts in it, and uh, I love the language too. I mean, uh, I 
in the excerpt, I just want to read this. I was standing with my father in the pitch black dark, the blackest dark I've, I've ever seen in the few short years of my young life, the blackest dark that I've ever since, uh, have seen since, which is a considerably longer span. The surrounding air was dank with flecks from, from falling water. And then you go on. But, and then she, I dare not move a muscle. And it just was powerful. It's just, it reminds me of those times when you are totally lost and you are kind of scared. And, uh, and so the question from my mind was, you know, what happened to the father? I mean, I, I, the, oh, there must have been something that happened to him. He, how could he possibly leave this young girl here? And, and, and what happened? You know, I, I started thinking about the conspiracy thing. It, you know, he might have fallen and they'll find her 30 years later, find him 30 years later. And, she's, you know, and, and as she goes for this quest. And so, I, you know, I, I could relate to that. I could relate to that because it 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 uh, because it it creates tension for me. And also there's curiosity. And then also I love the deeper question about abandonment when we are lost, when mm -hmm. we when when we're when we lose the structures around us that we can't fathom how to react anymore. I mean, the poor girl, I was like, uh, at the re end of this excerpt, she was, uh, she was stiff. Uh, and and uh, you wrote it in such a way that, that the people who were carrying her were complaining because she was stiff. Yeah, then, she was rigid with fear, absolutely rigid. Rigid with fear. And then her mother comes in and then there's this moment where she relaxes and was able to sleep. Yes. You know, there's a sense that, okay, I'm in a safe place. Um, right. I mean, I think that's, that's things that we all feel in, in life. Well, we all feel it. You know, I did go to Ruby Falls as a child. My parents took me. They did not leave me there. None of this story actually happened. <laughs> yeah. But I'll give you a little crazy God moment for me. In November, I had sent a galley to a director I worked with, a man by the name of Fred Walton. We'd done a film called April Fool's Day together. And I'd sent him a galley of the book and he sent me a beautiful email that he loved it. And I was talking to a friend and I said, this means a great deal to me because my father died when I was 19 years old and my father doesn't know anything I've done. And here I am, you know, having this life and this career. And I specifically said, my father doesn't know anything about Ruby Falls that same day. Now that sounds like exaggeration for the sake of the story. It's not. That same day I went to a storage unit to look for that famous box of baby clothes that I'd washed and ironed 30 years ago and packed away. And now my granddaughter was just about to grow out of the baby clothes I haven't found. Yeah. So I was on my way to the storage unit to look for that box. And there was another box of papers. And out of it fell this image. Can you see that? Oh my God, yeah. I could uh, move it over to the to the to your uh, left. Uh, maybe to your right then. There it is. Move it a little bit more. Yeah. There. Oh, wow. Is that you and your dad? That's my father and me at Ruby Falls. Oh, my God. And it fell out of the box. And it was, I got chills and a little teary because I felt like it was him saying, I see you. You don't think I see you? I see you. So I emailed my publisher immediately. I took a, a, a screen, you know, a phone picture of it. I was like, can we, can we please put this in the back of the book? And we made it. it the book hadn't been, you know, final printed. And I was just so touched by that. I was touched by the immediacy of it. Right then and there, right when I'm blabbing away of he doesn't know anything, he doesn't see me. He And it just fell right out of that box. And I don't remember that picture being taken. I do remember going to Ruby Falls, but the picture was a complete shock to me. So I think sometimes our messages are not always so immediate and we don't, we probably shouldn't try to expect them to be so immediate, but it was awfully nice when it came through just like that. Yeah. I love that. I, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I attribute it to God. I, I say, Me too. you know, there are these God moments where things just connect and they're, 
and where we find a, a moment of you know a, a awareness of something other than what we see right in front of us you know that's right and the other thing about this book the first two chapters of this book came to me in a complete bolt of inspiration i didn't intend to write this book that sentence you read it just came through me and i really worked for several years to make it the book i wanted it to be it and it is the book i wanted it to be and it's getting great reviews and scathing reviews from readers uh most critical reviews are great reviews but when you get bad reviews from readers i mean this is a great life lesson people are like i hate the book i don't like the ending you know whatever they say you what can you do with that other than go back think about did i create the work i wanted to create does it say what i wanted to say it does does it say it in the way i wanted to say it does and that is the spiritual practice because as as if we become really dependent on praise wow are we vulnerable to criticism because and yeah. that's that's a struggle that's something i think everybody needs to work with oh no yeah definitely and i think sometimes like a like sometimes when a sermon falls flat for me right uh, and and you know sometimes you hear oh it's a great sermon it's wonderful and then other times oh nothing right uh, you know the, the sometimes the reaction is important in that uh, something's working within the people who are reacting. Yes. You know? And so that, very, uh, this can be a triggering book to use a modern wor word for some people. It deals with issues of trauma and it twists and then it twists again with what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and it's referred to as being referential of uh, the Daphne du Maurier book, Rebecca and the Hitchcock film. It is, but it goes to a very different place from there. I don't just retread it. It is. Um... Yeah, no, you know, it's like, so, you know, nowadays in culture, you get these, these, uh, these ideas about, uh, you know, when you see like a Marvel film or a Marvel show, there's like Easter eggs, right? And so people see connections after the third or fourth time seeing a, a movie or reading a book. And so yeah. I think in the same way, there's some, there's some, uh, you, I mean, I, I could just see like the whole uh, reference to Hitchcock that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the show that she's going to be on means that this is going to be kind of like a, a suspenseful kind of mystery uh, that has a, a, a number of twists and turns. The, the darkness, the, all of this, it just makes me want to read it. And then also and the Easter eggs too. Very much so. And this thing about the Easter eggs and the images, I have a wonderful editor and she said a really important thing that helped me reshape the book a little bit. She said, when you get to the big revelation, she said, I want you to think about the movie, The Sixth Sense. And if you've seen that movie, yeah, I can spoil The Sixth Sense because I think everybody's seen it. There's a moment where you realize that the Bruce Willis character is dead. That is not the surprise in this book, so I'm not ruining my book. And what she said was, most audience members will not have figured that out before it's revealed, but then there's the moment where there's the breadcrumb trail that you can go back and repiece together. Yeah. She said, you need to make sure that when your big revelation of what is going on, that readers can say, oh, I didn't see it, but I could have seen it here, 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 here. So wow. I went back and polished and tweaked and refined what I think are my breadcrumb trail moments. They're there. And so I think the second read is really fun. <laughs> Knowing what's coming. I love it. I love it. Great. Well, Deborah, it's always so great to talk to you. It's really fun. Um, I, and I do want to make sure that everyone does come to the event. It's tomorrow night uh, for Lace Up uh, for Literacy. Um, I'm also on the board of that, uh, that of the literacy volunteers, and it's a great board. And uh, this event is, I, I haven't heard of Luan uh, Rice yet. 
Um, oh, she's from, she's terrific. She is from uh, like, or the area of Old Saybrook. She's written 35, 36 novels. They've been made into movies, New York Times bestseller. She really writes about our region. So she and I will be in conversation. It's a fundraiser, so it costs $125, but you get a book and the rest of the money goes to literacy volunteers for their literacy programs. And the tickets are available, I think on the Ocean House website or uh, the Savoy Bookstore website. Or you could even go to literacywashingtoncounty.org yeah. and uh, get uh, tickets there. So Luann Rice, does she write murder mysteries also? Or? She does, she writes a wide range of books. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. I'm, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting her as well. Well, Deborah, thank you again for, for all that you do for our community. And thanks for being on this show. And I hope you like it. I, I like talking to you. That's for well, sure. I love coming here. You really make my day. Thank you. You make my week. We oh. talk about good stuff. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you again. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't she wonderful? And uh, and folks, don't forget to come to the event if you can. Lace up for literacy. It's a it's a wonderful organization that, that helps uh, people in our community, um, Stonington uh, Westerly, uh, with reading, helping them to improve their reading skills, and uh, which is really key for the world for their um, success in the world. I don't have my prayer with me, the prayer from uh, Bishop Thomas uh, Brown, but so let's say a word of prayer extemporaneously. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the many gifts that you've given us. We thank you for uh, the moments in our life where we might have felt abandoned. And in the midst of that abandonment, in, that, in the midst of that loss of control, we cry out. We cry out to you just like the psalmist cries out to you. And, and as we cry out, we acknowledge that we are often helpless in the midst of a life that is challenging. Help us, Lord God, in those times to find you, to hear you, to see what you might see for us, to see in the midst of the disorientation, your, our orientation towards you. We pray that you will bless us with this sight and wisdom so that we may move our way through the darkness into the light. Lord, bless us and all the people of this world as we struggle with the challenge of COVID-19. Help us to find the way together to a place of light and hope for the world. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Uh, bring the peace and light of Christ to the world around you. The world needs it right now. Thanks for watching. Did you know that you can join Christ Church from anywhere in the world? If you're feeling connected to what we're doing, email us today at communicate at Christchurchwesterly.org.